Subscribers to The Australian hear episodes first and get access to all Shari's work on this topic, as well as unrivaled news, politics, investigations, sport and culture. Go to theaustralian.com.au slash Wuhan to find out more. I'm Shari Markson, and I've spent most of the past two years investigating the origins of COVID-19. 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 The Chinese city of Wuhan is under quarantine as the outbreak of the coronavirus worsens. The federal government has raised its travel advice for the Chinese provinces to Wuhan and Huabei to level four. This is the front line of the epidemic in Wuhan, and it is bleak. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. What really happened in Wuhan? Miles Yu was US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's principal China policy advisor. He was born in rural China in the Sichuan province under the communism, cruelty and famine of Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution. He's written a book on the intelligence activities of the Office of Strategic Services in China during World War II. Miles joined the State Department in late 2018 from the world of academia. He'd moved to the United States in 85 as a 23-year-old student. Pompeo reinforced Miles's already sceptical attitude towards the Communist Party. Pompeo told him the best way to deal with the Chinese Communist Party is to distrust and verify, to have a suspicious mind first and then try to prove yourself wrong. When the new coronavirus emerged in Wuhan, there were many people in the US government who knew about the type of research underway in Wuhan, at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but they stayed silent and it was left to officials like Miles to uncover. Miles, can I start with your early crucial work in January 2020 in starting to look at the Wuhan Institute of Virology? What made you begin to look at it and what did you find in those crucial early months? Okay, so by early 2020, this administration has developed a very healthy and the justifiable uh, suspicion of a lot of things China saying is doing and China promised to do. So we basically take a lot of things the Chinese government is doing and saying with a grain of salt. When a momentous events such as the outbreak of this uh, deadly virus occur, and we naturally try to find out what government is saying and also more importantly trying to find out what they're not saying. So that's my first instinct. Uh, as Secretary Pompeo's uh, China policy advisor, so I was sitting in the um, State Department uh, so every day since the beginning of this outbreak, uh, was looking basically for, for, uh, uh, for signs of uh, inconsistency. And uh, uh, it just so happened that uh, uh, I was the, uh, the person basically in this uh, China policy circle uh, who could basically read the Chinese with ease. So I basically started to scan uh, a lot of Chinese language sources. It turned out that's basically a, a, a treasure trove of information because uh, uh, for weeks and weeks, the Chinese government uh, kept silent on the outbreak. They're not saying anything as if nothing is happening. But at the, uh, in the public arena, in the Chinese blogging f- sphere, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, discussion going on. So citizen journalists, are beginning to send out their videos and reports and the hospital uh, situation reports on a daily basis. And it became really sort of widespread and very disconcerting. disconcerting. And uh, the Western media began to pick it up. So then I began to re- notice that there's something that's very odd, that is uh, there are many hospitals, like Jin Tan Hospital and uh, Wuhan uh, General Hospital. There's a lot of reports about those medical and uh, research, even Chinese Wuhan CDC, reported about those institutions and, and hospitals. But there was one institution that was never mentioned. And that was the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And this is the institution that's supposed to play a central role in explaining uh, uh, the nature of the virus and what they're doing, and, and but then it's totally silent. So I began to basically began to look at the information. Sure enough, and uh, I discovered some very, very troubling 
um, information, including the gag order, the instruction from the Chinese National Health Commission uh, to destroy original samples and to gag the scientists and the journalists and doctors from publicizing any information uh, vital to the understanding um, uh, of the origin and the nature of this virus. And that was, that was in January 2020. And uh, of course, uh, by early February, uh, the Chinese government was forced to admit, yes, there was a wall break, and, but they keep lying to the world through particularly uh, the World Health Organization, saying this is not the human-to-human -human, uh, you know, uh, uh, transmission, and any government that imposed travel restrictions was foolish and on, on, on uncalled for. And so the disinformation campaign started. So, and then I switched my attention, not just to finding the origin of the virus, but to uh, understand the scale of the cover-up by the Chinese government. And that, I think, is, is a much larger story that the world has not paid enough attention uh, to. That is the cover-up of the Chinese government uh, of this virus and disinformation campaign from the beginning. I completely agree. And I'll come back to the disinformation campaign. But before I do that, some of those crucial discoveries you made on January 25, 2020, what did you do after you made them? Who did you send them to? And, and what was the reaction? Okay, so when I uh, discovered uh, the astonishing degree to which Wuhan Institute of Virology has been conducting virus research, particularly bad coronavirus in that facility, and reported to, uh, to my superior, uh, basically, you know, Secretary of, of State uh, Mike Pompeo, I didn't give him any conclusive statement. All I said was, there is this institute called the Wuhan Institute of Virology at the epicenter of this outbreak that has been totally silent, yet by looking at the website, they actually uh, uh, had conducted extensive research on exactly the type of uh, 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 virus outbreak that we are sort of looking at, at, at right now. And uh, because this is so such an early stage, so instruction from him to me was, well, uh, keep looking, keep digging, to remain vigilance, report to me any significant uh, discovery you have made. So that's basically what I have sort of become his point man in tracking this uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, and what's going on in there. And uh, so that basically culminated in several weeks of work and uh, finally uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, submit my report to him uh, in April. But the key evidence I gather from open sources are already done by say early March, and they just need some verification and some keep updating. Uh, but keeping uh, uh, keeping sort of abreast of what's going on, what I have found out, and it, I, I think he he actually he took a great interest in in what I had to say. And uh, in the meantime, because he's such an important person, his words actually will mean something. There's a in severe policy implication, so I urge him to be. Uh, sort of to be careful about what he said in public and all we will say unless we have something that's really, really substantial and uh, especially uh, if we discover some smoking gun evidence. So, Miles, just take me through a bit more detail about that report, that dossier that you did for Pompeo that you presented to him in April. What were the key findings in that dossier? Okay, so initially um, when I started gathering this information, uh, for a, a final report, there was a insatiable demand from the media, from the public, uh, to know. And so they come to the State Department and they ask the secretary, ask our press officers, what do we know? What can we say about this virus? So uh, as I plugged along and discovering one piece after another, uh, and I think, you know, we selectively released some of the discoveries I did uh, to the media. Um, not in a comprehensive way, but we just uh, piece by piece and we tell them this is suspicious, this is circumstantial evidence, but there's a reason for us to conduct a serious inquiry of independent scientific uh, 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 research. So that was the, uh, the, the process. So uh, as the weeks went by, and I began to sort of put all things together, and that's basically is what uh, I submitted to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in late 
April. I believe the actual date was April 26 of 2020. One of the things you uncovered in that dossier was unbelievable evidence. A 2017 video made by the state-owned Chinese Shanghai Media Group where scientists actually admitted to having bat blood sprayed on them. I mean, what did you uncover about how poor the safety procedures were for the Wuhan scientists who were actually taking the bat samples? Okay, that's actually a very, very interesting uh, uh, detail. Thank you for, for asking me that. When I look at that video, I was astonished. Uh, uh, by some of the claims made in that video. This is a state-sponsored uh, uh, TV uh, program. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's actually, uh, it was uh, financed, funded by the Chinese Ministry of uh, Science and Technology, I believe. So it was totally official documentary about this Chinese man from the Wuhan um, CDC going through, going into all the caves in Hubei province, collecting deadly viruses from bats. And uh, of course, they knew the danger of those uh, uh, virus carrying animals. And so they took some measure, but those measures were very primitive. And in which actually they say there, uh, at, some, at some point he was a, uh, sort of a, uh, touched by the urines of the bats and he was infected. And he actually, he, I don't think he said he was infected, uh, take it back. I think he, he feel, feel that he had to be quarantined for 14 days, completely separate from his family and his, his, his colleagues at work. What's also astonishing in not discovery the video, I believe it's something 25 minutes long, is they put out this official statistics uh, by the Chinese government saying that in the previous 12 years, the Chinese scientists had discovered close to 2,000 deadly viruses unknown to mankind. It took the entire mankind over 200 years to discover that many um, uh, viruses. Uh, so uh, this actually uh, is instantly sort of a, a red uh, alarm in my mind because growing up in China, I know the Chinese Communist government likes to do things on a massive scale. There are megalomania, like those huge projects. And in great rush to greatness of, to prove the all round greatness of Chinese Communist Party, they do foolish things. Uh, they, they, they mess with God's creatures. They, may, they mess with nature. So this is one of the instances that, that uh, sort of uh, hacks back to the tragedies such as Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution and many of the other uh, uh, incredibly huge projects like hydroelectric dams that caused the lives of tens of millions of, pe of people in China. So this is something that I thought this was really, really amazing. In its rush to greatness, to dominate the bio-research and vaccine research, the CCP has ignored the safety of public health, not just only the public health of the Chinese people, but also the, the health of the world. And as the experience of last uh, year or two have uh, definitely uh, uh, proven. So this is, was the, the video that uh, I discovered, I believe uh, when I saw this, uh, I immediately sent a red alarm to basically the entire town. You know, people were doing China to NSC, to other agencies uh, and to the Hill. And I think I still have this, uh, this list of recipients um, um, and uh, the response was, okay, thank you, this is good, but the, let's keep looking. <laughs> so and I thought, Jesus Christ, we should have some kind of central team to look into this, pay enough attention to what the Chinese are saying. Uh, so there is a stronger urgency in me, and I basically reported to Secretary uh, uh, on all these uh, discoveries and my observations, um, while urging uh, our principals to be careful and not to say anything prematurely. Miles, another crucial part. Well, I want to go to two more things in that report. One of them, which is just amazing to me, is that this is something you had unpicked by March or April 2020, and it took the rest of us another year to start to try and unpick this story, is you spoke about the role that the scientific journals, the Western medical journals, had played in prioritising China's narrative when they were selectively publishing research. It's a sad story of uh, unprincipled compromise uh, in face of an authoritarian regime. 
And also, it is also a sad story of political wokeness because uh, the reason many scientists sign on to that kind of rhetoric to accuse anybody who is seriously interested in the possibility, not the certainty, but the possibility of a lab leak as simply racist. Uh, that is not a very scientific approach to, uh, to, uh, to inquiry. Rather, it's a political statement. And I was also very surprised by the overwhelming defense of the Chinese scientist uh, Shi Zhenli, for example, by many renowned scientists uh, in the United States in particular. And I, I look into this, and uh, it was surprising to me because their defense of her work in the Wuhan lab was not scientific in nature, but basically they always say, uh, they always function as if there were her character weaknesses. That's not what scientists are supposed to be doing. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, good scientists can do terrible things too. Uh, so this is this basically is something that we should look at it. And then most importantly, I think, you know, many of the scientists responded to uh, what our political leaders were saying and, and doing. They dislike our political leaders, particularly President Trump. Therefore, whatever the president was saying, they go to the, the other uh, uh, extreme. And uh, so they were not really acting like they're chi the scientists. They're more like they're uh, partisan hacks. And that was actually very, very unfortunate. Now, this is not just limited to the United States. You mentioned science journals. I remember uh, Lancet and uh, Nature uh, magazine both published a lengthy apologies to the Chinese scientists and accusing uh, uh, the people who are interested in the lab leak theory as conspiracy advocates. Uh, that's categorical sort of smear campaign. Because of this, uh, this uh, uh, unprincipled silence, categorical denial of any possibility of the lab theory, we waste about eight or nine months. Uh, and uh, after President Trump stepped down, and all the scientists discover, hey, listen, you know, we were wrong. And they are now coming back to endorse this uh, lab uh, uh, theory, uh, at least the inquiry possibility of that. So I think it's very unfortunate. And, and actually, this should be a very good lesson for the science community, in my view. Miles, the other really important discovery you made was that there'd been safety concerns by one of the senior directors of the Level 4 Laboratory, uh, Wan Ziming, about the safety standards at, the, at both the Wuhan Institute of Virology and at laboratories across China. How concerned was the Wuhan Institute of Virology, its own director, about the safety standards within his facility? That actually is a very interesting story because the gentleman that uh, we're talking about, uh, his name is Yuan Zhimin. Yuan Zhimin was himself is a scientist. He's a biologist uh, of some renown, and he was the he was the director of this P four level lab at the Wuhan Institute of Virology from the beginning until this day. He's still the director, so he knows China's biosafety issues. And to his credit, he actually has spoken quite uh, vociferously about the low standard of China's biosafety. He admitted candidly to to science, to journals, journalists prior to the outbreak of, of virus uh, of COVID that China's uh, biosafety standards is low, um, and the, the the personnel in those high level labs uh, were under trained and they didn't have enough safety procedure and equipment. And as you know, with the disclosure of the emails obtained through Freedom Information Act uh, between uh, uh, the uh, uh, NIAID, that is the Dr. Fauci's Institute, and the Chinese scientist, we know he actually wrote an email to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Dr. Fauci's people requesting uh, material safety uh, equipment uh, back in like 2015 or 2016. So this was uh, this was the director uh, of this uh, high level lab handling the most dangerous pathogens un known to man, and uh, he's saying all those scary things: how unequipped, how undertrained the Chinese lab people are. This is astonishing. 
Why do the why did the Chinese government uh, sort of a, a certification agency even give this labs uh, go ahead to handle those dangerous uh, pathogens and the viruses in the first place? So this is basically the begs the question of uh, of. Uh, uh, whether Why was the U.S. funding this research, given many of his statements, as you say, were in public documents and published in scientific journals? Well, that's a very complicated question. Now, the most benign uh, uh, interpretation from my perspective is that uh, in countries like the United States and Australia, UK, we have very strict uh, uh, research ethics guiding all the major research, particularly on bio biological and genetic research, because it's deeply scientific issue as also as a deeply moral issue, an ethical issue. So it's not easy for you to get on uh, some projects. Uh, you have to go through all kinds of re uh, restrictions and uh, scrutinies. China does not have that kind of environment. And uh, it's like the Wild West. For example, I know there are many scientists in this country who want to research on primates, for example. It's not easy to get permission to the West in the West to do so. But you can go to China. You 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 sign up with the, with the, your Chinese colleagues. You can do all kind of ex experiment on monkeys and all other primates. There's no problem. So that's the most sort of a, uh, there's a self interest involved there. Uh, and of course, our officials, bureaucrats, have this naive and benign uh, assumption of the motive and nature of the Chinese. Uh, scientific research. As we all, we all know right now, Wuhan Institute of Virology is not just an innocent civilian institution doing research for public health. It's also closely related to Chinese P People's Liberation Army's biological weapons research. And that secret part is, is, is a def defining feature of all China's labs because all will serve the interest, not the people, but the CCP. Uh, so that's the, that's the problem that we're having. I mean, with the, without that kind of understanding, it's not surprising to me that our government officials would give grants to Wuhan Institute of Biology. After you submitted that report, you discovered the existence of a document of China's official submission. This is the Chinese government's official submission to the 2011 United Nations Biological Weapons Convention. What did you discover and how did this shock you? In the early months of 2020, my primary focus was on the origin of the virus and also the cover up of this outbreak and the spread of the virus by the Chinese government. Uh, Bioweapon research was not the focus, but I did discover something that's really disconcerting. That's why I put it there as a last item to basically alert our uh, elected officials how serious this is. Uh, what I discovered was uh, the 2011 Chinese government submissions to the International Chemical and Biological and Toxic and Weapons Convention. Uh, China was one of the uh, like uh, two dozen countries that uh, participated in this uh, uh, regularly. Each country uh, in that group is obligated to submit what kind of research they're doing in their biological weapons labs. In 2011, the Chinese submission included uh, some very scary uh, 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 projects. One of them is called uh, population-specific genetic markers. That means they're working on biological weapons that potentially could target a particular kind of population with a unique ethnic or cultural genes. And that's very, very macabre uh, if, you count, uh, uh, if, you, if you want to infer what that actually means. And also, they have something called uh, um, uh, patho pathogens ready to transmit between humans. Uh, so it's, uh, they're weaponized this, uh, the, the, this biological research in China, and uh, they were very proud of that. That's why they submitted uh, in the open. And it was very shocking for me to, to see that uh, things like this actually were allowed, and there was no international outrage uh, uh, on this kind of things. So, uh, so that's why I wrote there. there. But, but now, of course, as I went on and I consulted our, uh, our uh, intelligence community, um, and I went back to look at some of the um, reports, 
by our intelligence agencies uh, over the years, and uh, some of them were actually excellent. Uh, um, and uh, so I began to put all those together and to realize there was the biological weapon component in the whole investigation. And that was actually very shocking to me. And uh, nowadays, I, I think people began to pay attention to that. And that's one of the reasons why uh, within the State Department, there is a biological weapons bureau, uh, 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 biological weapons compliance and the verification bureau, that ABC. Uh, uh, they began to investigate into this uh, weapons uh, uh, perspective. And, but that was basically a several months gap, and they didn't know my report, uh, because my report was basically sent to the Secretary Pompeo, until several months later in probably uh, November or December 2020. There's another document as well that you obtained when you were in the State Department, and, and then I understand that you passed on to that AVC team and that was this book done by Chinese military scientists, including Zhu Dezhong, which warned about the weaponization of coronaviruses just five years before the pandemic. That's right. Um, we have to understand the way Chinese government uh, thinks uh, on major strategic issues. One of the most important aspects of a Chinese strategic culture is this this uh, uh, deeply rooted uh, paranoia about a international anti-China forces led by the United States, presumably, to stifle uh, the triumph of a socialist cause led by the CCP. So they basically envision this international conspiracy uh, in every each way to basically stop China from rising again. Uh, you can see this from Xi Jinping's talks, from every Chinese propaganda uh, 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 you know, uh, outlets. Um, they're, they're basically saying this, this sort of things. Now, of course, we can always say that's propaganda, just hype. But they have practical consequences. One of the most important things is it actually guides how China develops its weapons platforms. And this is where this 2015 book comes in. This book was published in 2015 by the PLA's uh, own um, uh, medical science publisher in Beijing. This book was mostly, uh, the, this, it's an anthology of many uh, uh, papers. Most of the authors belong to the 4th Military Medicine Hospital Academy, which is based in Xi'an, uh, um, uh, in the northwest part of China. All the Chinese People's Revolution Army military biologist, military scientist, uh, uh, make this central argument. The argument was this. It started with the 20, 2003 SARS outbreak in China. They all believe that SARS outbreak in China was not naturally occur. It was indeed a biological weapon launched against China by a foreign power, presumably the United States. So this is the central argument of the book, at least a part of that. And what does it mean is that it provides a justification for China to research this kind of viruses as a weapon. Because the theory goes, if the enemy did that on us, therefore, it's totally justifiable for us to do uh, to, to research on some kind of more lethal biological weapons, uh, vir virological weapons against the enemy. So that actually, to me, is very significant. Now, the second part of the book, basically, uh, is almost like an advocacy piece. It will strongly advocate the Chinese government to develop uh, uh, what's called contemporary genetic weapons which means that basically to use this genetic study, to use a virological study to develop weapons, to weaponize all the viruses um, as the legitimate pursuit of the tools of war in modern time. This is a not a fly-by argument by some lunatic scientist. This is the official Chinese People's Liberation Army military biology scientist and we argue by a large group of people. So we have to take them seriously. Now, you might say, oh, this is just on the periphery because uh, this is not a mainstream argument of China. How do we know? 
Because in a country like China, uh, where there's no free exchange of ideas, everything published reflects, in, to a larger degree, the view of the government, official position. Because any views that government doesn't like never get published. So that's why we should take a publication like this very seriously. And that's a 2015 book. And if you read the book, it will chill your spine. Miles, I needed you mounting that argument publicly when I was attacked when I published that story. Uh, And I think also the fact that they were teaching PhD students this theory and and actually teaching them how to unleash a bio attack. That, That was part of the paper as well. But, um, Miles, one other thing that was included in that dossier of yours that you gave to Pompeo was the mysterious case of Huan Yang Ling. What do you make of that? Do you think she has disappeared or do you think it's accurate that she might be working in Chengdu, as the Chinese Communist Party says? Her name has been listed on patents. But on the other hand, the Chinese Communist Party hasn't been able to produce her in order to shut down the rumours that she had disappeared or become infected or, or even died. This was really widespread, these reports in on Chinese social media and not in the US. This is in, in Chinese media and even traditional media outlets reported on her alleged disappearance. In the early days of the outbreak, in the absence of official reporting or mentioning of this outbreak, citizen journalists, people who actually uh, former insiders, they came out um, like swinging. They put out a lot of information uh, in, uh, in the cyberspace. Um, specifically, there are two, two very important pieces. One of them is the allegation that the Wuhan Institute of Virology had been selling lab animals uh, to people in the open market, either as, as pets or as foods. So, I mean, some of the allegations are very detailed, very uh, sort of uh, specific. And they challenged the Wuhan Institute of Virology, particularly Dr. Shijin Li herself, to come here to debate, to prove them wrong. And the Wuhan Institute of Virology has never responded to take up that challenge. So that is actually very telling itself. Secondly, you mentioned the Huang Yanling case. Uh, that was also widely spread, as you, as you mentioned correctly, um, in the Chinese media, um, and particularly citizen journalism and cyberspace. Uh, her name, he's, he, she became an instant celebrity of, of sort. The idea was that some people suspect that she was a patient zero because the Wuhan Institute of Virology suddenly, after the outbreak of the, uh, of the virus, removed her picture and information on its website. People naturally began to ask why. Once we ask why. So the Wuhan Institute of Virology never came out with a clear answer. All this says this person is okay. She never was infected. She's still working somewhere in other provinces, presumably uh, um, uh, in Sichuan uh, uh, province, and she's fine. But they never produced any live photo of her, any video of her, any interaction, media mention of her. Uh, and, you know, in the West, you might say, oh, this person just want just to want to protect her privacy. In China, privacy in the interest of, of, of the state doesn't exist. So it would, have been, it would have been such a big, triumphant media scoop for the Chinese government to showcase her, to give like 10 seconds of her appearing somewhere, making a speech, show up in the news media, and that would have basically you know, scored a major uh, victory for the Chinese propaganda machine. She never did. She is literally disappeared from public view. Uh, so that is a, a yet another piece of circumstantial evidence. Of course, we cannot prove you know, anything um, 100%. But that's actually uh, through logical reasoning, you can see where, why people, why the world wants to know the truth of the virus and the, the truth of the virus and the scale and nature of the virus, because there simply has been too much disinformation put out by the Chinese government. So when I say you no know, distrust and verify, that's not only is the uh, the U.S. government approach to China in the last several years. I think increasingly, it's the it's the policy and the practice of uh, of the world vis-a-vis the Chinese government behavior. 
Just another quick point on Huan Yangling. Not only was she wiped from the Wuhan Institute of Virology website, but her entire social media and online presence disappeared. There's virtually nothing left of her. There, there's a single photograph. Yeah, I mean, uh, making people disappear is actually a major feature of the regime. I mean, uh, it's actually truly a People's Republic of Disappearances. <laughs> uh, dissidents, uh, uh, journalists, and anybody the government doesn't like, they disappear. They disappear into oblivion um, forever. So, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this, this, is, this is basically a, a regime that is not only capable of doing these things and then do this with great pride. And, and so uh, uh, we have seen people like this, who disappear for decades, like Tibetan spiritual leaders, uh, uh, the Banchan Lamas, and some of the uh, religious uh, leaders, particularly Catholic bishops, they spend uh, almost like an entire their adult life in Chinese prison without uh, being uh, sort of uh, mentioned or show up anywhere. So, uh, so this is basically, you know, it's a pattern. Uh, with the, enabled by uh, very sophisticated and modern technology, the Chinese government has perfected the, the, the skill of disappearing people. It's so, so sad. And so many people connected with the outbreak, whistleblowers who were trying to sound the alarm about either the existence of the virus or information about its spread in Wuhan. So many people in those early days have now disappeared. What do you think about that? And and also, what do you think's happened to them? We know many people who spoke out or just do what an ordinary citizen was supposed to be doing, reporting what he or she saw in the hospital corridor, the dead bodies and how the doctor is trying to save lives. Uh, those people disappeared forever. Uh, we still have one person, for example, Fang Bin, right? We never know what happened to him. Um, and then for other more famous people, people with uh, large national followings, uh, they were basically uh, smeared severely, they were isolated, they become a target of the nation. The, the government unleashed this unbelievable uh, reputational attack and assault on writers like, uh, like Fang Fang, for example, who wrote a diary documenting her true feelings, what was really like as an ordinary person during the pandemic in Wuhan city, which was locked down. So for that, she became a target of the state, literally enemy of the state. Her only crime was telling the truth and telling the panic, the helplessness of ordinary Chinese people uh, uh, during this crisis. So the reason why this is happening is because Xi Jinping made a speech in mid-February 2020. As the Supreme Leader of the nation, he wanted to use this occasion of this enormous catastrophe to China to showcase the greatness of the Chinese Communist Party. In other words, public health, truth, none of this really matters as nearly as much as the reputation of the Communist Party. So he used this occasion to enhance the reputation of the Chinese Communist Party among the people. And as such, he specifically directed that no negative reporting. We have to put out positive reporting on, this, on, the, on the virus and also the campaign led by the Chinese Communist Party combating this virus outbreak. Uh, anybody who reported negatively will be dealt with severely. This is his public speech. Because of this, I believe the Secretary General of the Chinese Communist Party is directly responsible for the spread of the virus that actually uh, harms uh, the entire world. Over 4 million people have died. Just another thing in that speech, well, I think it was that speech, or it might have been an earlier speech that Xi Jinping gave, where he spoke about the need to tighten the loopholes in biosafety. He, his very first public appearance since the outbreak, and he introduces new laws to tighten laboratory safety. What does that tell you? That tells me, uh, uh, basically, uh, there was a leak, there was some kind of a biosafety violations that resulted in this terrible 
uh, 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 scourge. Otherwise, there's no reason for him to make such a statement uh, as to how to uh, sort of, you know, uh, eradicate the China's loopholes and China's shortcomings in biosafety and biosafety standards, particularly the management of highly dangerous biological lab materials. Uh, so uh, he said uh, uh, famously that the biosafety law is part of the national security law, right? So uh, that was in February 2020. Uh, and incidentally, what Xi Jinping was saying in that speech, very long speech, echoed what Dr. Yuan Zhiming had been saying for years. That is, China's biosafety standard is so low, it's so dangerous, we have to do something. We have to really pay attention to this, uh, to this very serious uh, crisis of biosafety standards. Uh, because China has developed and discovered so many dangerous viruses. We have to really enhance our handling of those viruses. So it would not surprise me if Yuan Zemin actually was the briefer to, to uh, Xi Jinping uh, uh, for that speech, because uh, after all, Yuan, Dr. Yuan is, was the director of China's highest biosafety level lab that handles the most dangerous uh, uh, viruses in Wuhan, by the way. So uh, that was very telling. I would say that's probably one of the strongest circumstantial evidence that this virus actually uh, came out of the leak from the lab. Miles, thank you very much. I really am grateful for your time. We still don't know what happened to all of those brave whistleblowers who tried to alert us to what was really going on in China. One young lawyer, Chen Kuishi, who caught the last train to Wuhan, reappeared on social media briefly in October 2021 after my book and documentary came out that featured him heavily. But there's been no independent verification of his safety and he hasn't been seen again since. Those sentenced to house arrest in China are not exactly sitting around watching Netflix. A report by the Madrid-based human rights NGO Safeguard Defenders describes residential surveillance as mass state-sanctioned kidnapping and enforced disappearance. That's assuming they're still alive. And unfortunately, we have no proof of that. What Really Happened in Wuhan is presented by The Australian. It's written and produced by me, Shari Markson, and The Australian's editorial director, Claire Harvey. It was produced by Liat Samaglu. My book, What Really Happened in Wuhan, is available online at Amazon, in bookstores in Australia at Dimox, or wherever you buy your books.